very warm welcome to everyone for uh, this morning or this afternoon's webinar, depending where in the world you're joining us from. Um, my name is Jessica Gordon. I'm um, program manager for the M Nutrition Evaluation based at the Institute of Development Studies. Um, and on behalf of the whole uh, evaluation team, I'd like to say a very warm welcome to this webinar today, which focuses on the role of mobile phone based agriculture services to support uh, improved agriculture and nutrition practices. So we'll be drawing on our, our recently completed um, independent evaluation of the M Nutrition Initiative with a, a specific focus on the M Agri service in Ghana. Um, before we get going, I just wanted to say a special welcome to those of you who were due to join us at the um, Lessons Learned workshop last month in Accra, Ghana, which unfortunately we had to cancel due to coronavirus restrictions. Um, we really hope that, that this webinar today will be a, a great alternative forum for discussion and, and thanks for being able to join us um, in this session. Um, and, and finally, just to, to add that obviously we appreciate the, that everyone's facing quite challenging circumstances at the moment with dealing with coronavirus. And so we're really grateful that you've been able to find the time amongst child caring and other responsibilities to, to make it to join us to discuss this, this topic. So um, as I said, I'm, I'm going to be moderating. I'm Jessica from IDS and I wanted to introduce you first of all to the um, key speakers um, for the session today. So um, we have representatives from the, the three lead organizations for the um, M Nutrition Evaluation here today. Firstly, Dr. Inka Barnett, um, who is based at the Institute of Development Studies in Brighton, UK. Um, Inka is a, a senior research fellow at IDS. Her background is um, as a behavioral epidemiologist and nutritionalist. She's got over 15 years of experience in international nutrition research. And a lot of her research focuses on understanding nutrition related behaviors in resource poor settings and how the use of technologies, innovative digital technologies can promote behavior change. Um, we also have Dr. Melissa Hidrobo from the International Food Policy Research Institute, um, whose head office is in Washington DC US and I I believe Melissa is joining us from Dakar, Senegal. Uh, Melissa is a, a senior research fellow in the Poverty, Health and Nutrition Division of IFPRI. She is an applied microeconomist by background, working at the intersection of gender, early childhood development, agriculture and social protection. And we also have a key speaker from GAMOS, Dr. Nigel Scott who is one of the directors of GAMOS along with Simon Batchelor. Um, and Nigel has more than 20 years of experience of working in the development sector. So thank you to our, our, our panelists. I'll just quickly talk through the agenda and then mention a few general housekeeping rules around using this Zoom um, function for the webinar today. So um, we have just under an, an hour and a half of the session overall. Um, once I've covered a few housekeeping issues, Inca will provide a, a bit of an overview to the M Nutrition Initiative and the particular services in Ghana that we were exploring in our evaluation and some of the components of the evaluation design. Um, we'll then move on to a session led by Inca and Melissa from IFPRI, focusing on design, how sort of lessons learned around designing and implementing mobile phone based information services to change behaviors. That'll be about 20 minutes or so. Then we'll have about 15 minutes focusing on the commercial viability question and the business model for mobile phone services, which um, Nigel from Gamos will be leading us through. And we should then have around 40 minutes or so um, for Q&A and discussion as a group. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll raise some housekeeping related questions in a second around that session. Um, and then some final remarks from the evaluation team. So just a couple of housekeeping points to, before we move on to the main session. Um, this webinar is being recorded um, and we will be sharing that recording on our M Nutrition Evaluation 
web page. There's a link to that in the presentation you can see. Um, if you do have any questions, um, because we don't want to interrupt the flow of the, of the presentations, what we'd ask you to do is please post those in the chat box, which um, for those of you not familiar with Zoom is usually I think at the bottom of your screen, there's a little box you can click on and that will um, bring up a panel you can type into. And we'll be keeping track of, of those questions throughout the presentations. And then when we get to the, the Q&A session, the, the latter part of the, of the session, we can come back to those and, and pass those back to the panelists to respond to. Um, and at that point, um, people could also choose to raise their hand and ask questions um, verbally during that final session. But we ask people please not to raise their hand during the the actual presentations. Um, and also just to remind people, please to keep your mics muted to avoid any background noise while others are speaking. Um, and we've gone for the audio rather than video option on this call um, so as to avoid any technical bandwidth issues. Um, and if you do have any technical problems, please to drop a quick line to Sophie Marsden, the IDS communications manager who can help deal with any of those. So. Um, that's it from housekeeping side. Um, Inka, would you like to go ahead and kick us off with the background and nutrition? Yeah, thank you um, very much, Jess. And um, thank you to the audience for joining today's webinar. Um, as you know, there has been a lot of interest in the last few years in leveraging mobile phone technology for behavior change and both nutrition and agriculture in low and middle income countries. But what lags a little bit behind is rigorous evidence um, on the impact of mobile phone based intervention, which is why DFID commissioned us, the Independent Impact Evaluation Consortium, to conduct a rigorous impact evaluation of um, the M Nutrition Initiative in two countries, in um, Ghana and Tanzania. Today's um, webinar will focus on our findings from Ghana and here in particular practical lessons learned from the evaluation. I would like to start off by briefly presenting M Nutrition, the M Nutrition initiative. It's a global initiative supported by DFID, um, organized by GSMA and implemented by um, local MNOs, mobile phone network providers and other providers in 12 countries across uh, Sub-Sahara Africa and South Asia. M -Nutrition, M Nutrition uses mobile phone based services and here SMS, recorded voice messages and also call centers to scale up the delivery of nutrition, health and agriculture information and promote behavior change around key um, nutrition and agricultural decisions with the ultimate aim of improving the nutritional well-being of households. The content for M Nutrition was developed by GAIN, the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, and then locally adapted and delivered via existing M Health platforms or M Agri platforms. The focus of today's um, webinar is M Nutrition delivered via an M Agri platform in Ghana, and the, the combination of M Agri platform plus M Nutrition in Ghana is called Vodafone Pharma Club. To give you um, a kind of quick overview of what Vodafone Pharma Club is, it's an innovative combination of nutrition and agriculture information delivered via a mobile phone service. Vodafone Pharma Club is a bundled um, solution. It includes uh, three recorded voice messages with agricultural tips per month for subscribers, three recorded voice messages with nutrition trips, uh, nutrition tips and the nutrition tips are here around the crops the farmer grows but also includes information on food preparation food safety and a little bit on dietary diversity and here in particular animal sourced food consumption Vodafone Pharma Club also includes a weekly SMS and daily SMS, a weekly SMS with market price information and daily SMS with weather information and subscribers can contact a call center free of charge uh, to speak further with an agriculture or nutrition 
expert. Vodafone Pharma Club also enables free calls to other subscribers um, to, the, to the service. For our impact evaluation, we used a mixed methods approach, um, including three different components, a qualitative component consisting of three qualitative rounds, an experimental quantitative design, and here a, a randomized control trial, or um, in Ghana, a randomized encouragement design, and a business modeling component that used um, different uh, data collection um, um, rounds and different types of data. In our presentation today, we will draw on findings and triangulate, find, triangulate findings from all three components. For further um, information and details on the methodology used for each of the uh, components and also how we combine the different components, please have a look at our website and here in particular at the method specific reports, but also um, at the method briefs that we um, wrote to give further details on the methodology. In today's webinar, we would like to start by um, talking about how to design and implement mobile phone based information services to change behavior. First of all, we would like to talk about what factors affect the reach and uptake of mobile phone based information services, drawing on our findings from the evaluation from Ghana. Um, secondly, what approaches can be used to increase the effectiveness of mobile phone based services um, to ch in changing behaviors? And um, thirdly, what strategies work best to design engaging content for, for um, especially SMS based and recorded voicemail based and mobile phone based services aiming to change behaviors? And now over to Melissa. Thank you, Inka. Um, as Inka mentioned, the quantitative component of the evaluation used a randomized encouragement design where we randomly assigned some communities to receive additional promotion of the Vodafone Farmer Club service, offering the service for free through a door-to-door -door marketing. What you see here is the, our sample of encouraged households in the encouragement group, and of households in the encouragement group, 68% reported signing up to the Vodafone Farmer Club service. This is compared to 1% in the comparison group. So in other words, households in the encouragement group were 67 percentage points more likely than our households in the comparison group to have registered for the Vodafone Farmer Club service following the door-to-door -door campaign. Despite these initial successes with um, registration with initial registration only 27 percent of households had someone still signed up 18 months later which indicates quite high dropout dropout rates what you see here is um, on active usage of the service and so only 50 percent of respondents that had registered um, used the service anytime in the last 18 months this means that only 30 percent 34% of encouragement households use the service at all. So that's a 646 um, out of 1,901 households. At the very bottom, you see that overall, only 22% of the target population listen to the messages, and this is with respect to the, vo the nutrition voice or agriculture messages, always or often. So, we, we find uh, high dropout rates and also low active usage rates of the service. Next. Mobile penetration is high and growing. We recognize that mobile penetration is high and growing even in remote areas. However, based on our findings, mobile phone technology is not an inclusive technology yet, especially what we find is that very poor households and women were often excluded from accessing the service. The common barriers uh, to reach and sustained uptake that we found are, first of all, a lack of available supportive infrastructure, and especially the main reason for not using the service was that sim, the sims that were given were just not used and this has to do with um, multiple sim usage in in these areas in Ghana. 
in some areas there was a limited network coverage um, and also limited access to mobile phones so although most households or all households almost had a mobile phone not everyone had within the household had the same access and this is especially women were usually not the main owners of the phone and then in some areas there was also diff difficulties with electricity the second um, barrier is the capacity of users specifically with respect to literacy um, many of the users were illiterate and, and could not read um, with the voice messages many did not really understand how the voice messages worked um, and then there were also issues of implementation with respect to sort of fluctuations in the services messages not being sent when they should be sent and issues in the service design um, it was a quite difficult uh, process to register and profile farmers the profiling was very important because farmers needed to be profiled to their language, to their region, to their crop of preference, but it did make it for um, a, a longer, more difficult process of onboarding. Next. So how to optimize the reach and uptake. What we recommend is, first of all, to make sure that there's a supportive infrastructure in place so that network coverage is is good that um, most households have access to a mobile phone um, and there's electricity and if this is not met then alternative modes of content delivery or blended approaches so may have a wider reach so combining the mobile services with radio or with the community outreach um, would have a wider reach and be more inclusive the second is design the service to match the capacity of the target group um, Text-based information can be very cost-effective in areas with high literacy, um, but voice message information is preferred in areas with high illiteracy, so in areas where a lot of the population isn't literate. Um, however, we recognize that voice messages are going to be more expensive to administer and could increase the cost. Um, and the third recommendation is to design the onboarding features to help reach, to help increase the reach and uptake. So this includes having an easy registration and profiling process, preferably by a trusted person. Um, have a short time period from initial registration and profiling to receiving the first sort of text message or voice message. Um, have clear sender details so that messages are not mistaken for spam. Um, those are examples of things that should be considered, especially for the onboarding process. Next. So in terms of the effectiveness of mobile phone based services and changing behaviors, what we found is we found that the Vodafone Pharma Club had no impact on dietary diversity, agriculture production, income or nutrition or farming knowledge. Um, below is a table of the indicators that we analyzed. Um, HDDS is the household's dietary diversity scale and on average households consumed nearly six out of 12 different food groups in the last 24 hours. Um, women's dietary diversity was moderate at four out of 10 food groups with around 50% meeting the minimum dietary diversity recommended by the WHO. In terms of farming, households grew fewer than three crops on average with a total area of 1.7 acres. So we show here both the intent to treat and the late estimates, impact estimates. The intent to treat is really just showing the difference in the average outcomes between the comparison group and those that were assigned to the randomized encouragement group, regardless of whether they participated or not, regardless of whether they registered or not for the Vodafone Pharma Club service. And then we also look at the local average treatment effect, the late, which is the difference in outcomes between the households in the treatment group that were induced to participate in the M Nutrition service by the random offer and households in the comparison group that would have participated in the M Nutrition service had they received the random offer, so the compliers. In both um, impact estimates, we really find no, no impacts of the Vodafone Farmer Club on any 
of our outcomes analyzed. And the reasons the, for the lack of in, impact include both low active usage rates and then also the light touch, a light touch intervention. Next. So what approaches would increase the effectiveness of mobile phone based services and changing behaviors? We recommend four different um, components or four different design features. First is to introduce interactive components. Um, such as call centers and active information search functions. Uh, we found that um, farmers in our sample really liked the call center, but they just didn't realize that it was available. They didn't realize that, that the service was provided or they thought they might be charged for the service for calling the call center, but they actually really liked that interactive component. That was the preferred um, aspect of the service. You should, they should not rely on just pushing out information to a passive audience. The second re recommendation is to combine mobile phone based services with financial services or ongoing interventions so that users of the mobile phone based services can um, can actually act upon the recommendations. And so, for example, we, there might be a recommendation or information sent on how much fertilizer the farmer should be using. Um, but if a farmer can't actually, uh, doesn't have the financial means to buy the fertilizer, he won't be able to actually act upon it. The third recommendation is to integrate a mobile phone based information services into existing programs or policies. This was actually done in the companion study in Tanzania with M Health. M Health was very well integrated with the government's um, with the government's program, and so such services were helping to reinforce and embed existing knowledge, and ultimately change behaviors. And the last one is um, that we recommend intensive and interpersonal support to influence practices, um, and it should be offered to complement the mobile phone based services. Um, so in addition to having the mobile phone based services and the text messages and the voicemail, um, interpersonal support from local agents is, is highly recommended to the extent possible. And I'll, now I'll hand it back over to, to Inka. Um, thank you, Melissa. So what can we learn from the evaluation with regards to designing, engaging, and the effective content for mobile phone based intervention aiming to change behaviors. So what we found both um, drawing on qualitative and quantitative data is that the acceptance of the service among the subsample of farmers who were successfully reached and who actively engaged with the with the service was actually really high. They really liked the, the messages, they really liked the recorded voice messages, but also the um, SMS messages. They felt they were really useful, um, especially they liked the time sensitive agricultural information and also area specific weather information, for example. They find them easy to use, they kind of uh, find the messages, the recorded messages easy to understand, for example. They're trusted in the credibility of of the content of the messages and they also felt that their peers kind of supported the use of mobile phone based information to inform practices. So what can we learn in particular from, from this with regards to developing content? Farmers really liked practical low cost advice that was actionable and achievable. For example, a lot of farmers mentioned that they like advice on how to make natural fertilizer using farm waste. This was mentioned very often or other hands on information that they were often missing from other information services and here agricultural extension services or for the nutrition information health facilities. So they wanted really hands on information. They liked the non-judgmental tone in the messages that was often different from what they experienced from agricultural extension worker or also overworked healthcare workers with regards to nutrition messages. They um, kind of, we recommend to introduce and strengthen existing two-way communication channels, um, especially as Melissa has already mentioned, call centers were really liked by the 
by the farmers who use them or any kind of interactive dialogues. Um, also, information demands are really dynamic and people often look for timely information on urgent problems and how to tackle them best. So it might be an idea to in, in kind of include some kind of active search functions in mobile phone based services that allowed farmers to access information they needed at the time they needed them. Of course, this would have cost implication for mobile phone based services. Also really important is that the content is really carefully tailored towards uh, the crops the farmers grew um, and this has to happen at the initial registration stage for the product um, because poor targeting, so receiving messages where, that were not relevant could lead to very quick disengagement with the services. Of course, um, extensive uh, tailoring and profiling in the initial stage of a mobile phone based intervention has cost implication and um, is time consuming and consider alternative channels to engage male farmers. While male farmers who engaged with the service like the agricultural advice, they were not so enthusiastic about the nutrition advice, um, in particular because they perceived nutrition is really a task for women. At least this is what came, came out of the qualitative work. And therefore it might be a good idea to consider um, alternative channels to reach men in particular with nutrition, with nutrition advice. Female farmers um, appreciate the, appreciated the nutrition advice. And now over, and now over to Simon and Nigel for the second part. Hi. Um, just before I get another set of slides up, what we uh, did with looking at the um, business modeling side of things was we, we looked at um, also the other program that was running in Tanzania, the Wazazi Nipandeni program, because it provides a very interesting um, contrast to the Vodafone Farmers Club. So what we've done is we've tried to um, pick out some lessons to be learned from comparing and contrasting the two. The previous presentations focused on the users of uh, these mobile for development information services, uh, looking in particular at how they changed behavior and how they led to some kind of positive impact on development outcomes. In this presentation, however, we look the other way towards both the companies and institutions that provide the services. We consider the business and commercial arrangements that lie behind these services and then we highlight differences between the two which are quite different approaches. We're also thinking about this from a pro-poor point of view given that the M-Nutrition program was funded by the Department for International Development. Okay first of all let's uh, see how the two services that we've studied fit in with the rest of the M Nutrition projects. This slide shows the Vodafone Farmers Club was the first of the agricultural services to get going but both growth in subscriber numbers was relatively slow and slower than expected so at the beginning of 2019 the service was paused as Vodafone then thought about how to revise their strategy. In contrast, this slide shows that Wazazi Nipendeni got the most users of any of the health related services. Note that five out of these eight services are led by mobile operator, but Wazazi Nipendeni is one of the ones that's not. On the other hand, all of the MAGRI services were MNO led. So, so this gives us a fundamental and really interesting distinction between the two case studies that we've looked at. Okay, so how would we describe these business models? 
First, let's take a look at Vodafone Farmers Club. VFC was effectively a B2C business to customer model where Vodafone sells the service directly to customers. We've, we've actually called it a partnership model here because different bits of the service are delivered to the customer by both partners. Vodafone provides voice calls and deal with the billing, while eSoco delivers the messages and provide the call center facility. Part of the original business plan was that uh, VFC would provide low cost product with lots of features to attract low income farmers onto the network. And this is why VFC was bundled as a SIM product. So it was designed to bring in airtime revenue from new customers as well as monthly subscriptions. Wazazinip and Deni is quite different as the government insisted that health information services must be made available free of charge. So there was no way of raising direct revenue from users. Instead, costs are met by donors and partner operators. This is similar to the multi-sided business models often used by tech companies like Uber, for example, which puts customers in contact with drivers. It's a little different in that users are not actually buying anything from funders, but we've argued that the funders with a health mandate actually get a benefit from improved health outcomes among users. This is effectively a business to business or B2B model because although messages are delivered to users, a lot of the public private partnership effort goes into field partners who are implementing health programs on the ground. And it's this community level presence that turns out to be really important. For example, registration data shows that over 80% of users may have been registered with the assistance of one of these partners. In this slide, we've tried to summarize some of the key differences between the two case studies. We've already talked about differences in direct revenue that uh, Vodafone Farmers Club targeted new customers and that Wazazi Nipendeni integrated the service with field programs. So let me draw your attention to a couple of other points. Yeah. Firstly, who's in charge of the product? VFC was operator led. It was Vodafone branded. Vodafone made the pricing decisions, but they bought in the technical expertise from Isoka under contract. Wazazi Nipendeni on the hand on the other hand, was driven by the PPP. They provided all the technology and most importantly, they made alliances so that the service could be made available on multiple networks. Next, VFC was a complex product. It wasn't just an agricultural information VAS. It was also a SIM. Some calls were charged and some were free. And there was a call center where you could speak to agricultural experts in local languages. This meant that most customers weren't actually aware of all the features available. And it also caused some difficulties on the supply side. For example, some agents selling the SIMs didn't understand the features themselves, and some just sold VFC SIMs if it was all they had left. Another key difference relates to funding. As an operator-led product, VFC had to be commercially viable, generating either direct or indirect revenue in some way. On the other hand, was as in and Denny was donor funded, yet it still had to perform, but financial performance was not the bottom line. VAS business models rely on direct revenue, such as cash from subscription fees and or indirect benefits. And these usually revolve around increased market share, brand loyalty, reduced churn, increased expenditure on airtime. Given that Wazazi Nipendeni did not generate any direct revenue, and neither did Vodafone Farmers Club when the subscription fees were suspended for a period, this slide looks at indirect benefits. The quantitative study was able to show that Wazazi Nipendeni users spent more on airtime. A 10 to 20% increase represents a substantial and real financial benefit to operators providing the free SMS messages. The qualitative study was then able to unpack this a bit when they found 
that using the service helped women feel more comfortable using their phones. So they then made more calls, spending more money. One point to note is that uh, the VAS business model assumes consumers have a choice. So you can only reduce churn if people are regularly swapping providers. However, in many of the study areas, coverage was patchy and there was often only one network available. In these kinds of areas, which are typically poorer communities, consumers are effectively trapped into using the only network available. Okay, moving on to costs. The quite different cost structures in this slide reflect the differences in the business models. For example, Vodafone Farmers Club is dominated by variable costs because sales agents were paid on a commission in sales and the contract with eSoco fixed a sliding scale of payments per user. Wazazi Nipendeni costs, on the other hand, are dominated by the cost of running the PPP, which includes the technical platform. If you're going to sell a service directly to consumers, that's B2C, especially those on low income, then minimizing costs is a top priority. So note that the costs of SMS was the largest single cost component for Vodafone Farmers Clubs and also the largest variable cost for Wazazi Nipendeni. So let's go on to consider this in more detail. This chart shows how sensitive the financial viability of VFC, represented by internal rate of return here, is to SMS prices. The two lines represent scenarios when the service was made available for free and then when the subscription fee was reintroduced at a lower rate of half a CD per month. So this raises an interesting and much argued point. What is the real cost of sending an SMS? Messages have been costed at retail prices in these charts, but it can be argued, for example, that the cost of Wazazi Nipendeni was zero because messages were donated by operators. Similarly, the real cost of Vodafone of sending messages is likely to be well below retail prices. The chart indicates that, subject to all other assumptions made in the model, even if the service is made available for free, it is possible to generate a reasonable return if SMS prices can be discounted far enough. The key distinction is that a third party led product will need to pay a real cost of bulk buying SMSs from operators, whereas an operator led product may be able to discount these costs internally. Supporting the poorest is always a challenge, and this is true for SMS-based information services as well. While SMS is cheap, it excludes those who can't read, and local languages are an issue because people can struggle to read their local language in written form. Voice messages can overcome this, but they are much more expensive. In the study areas, many people struggled to find a reliable network connection, so there are still many people living in remote areas that can't be reached by mobile services. People with poor literacy will struggle with registering for services, especially anything that requires a lot of customer profiling information, like the agricultural information services. They can also be risk averse and afraid of technology. And this is where having a presence on the ground really helps, but that's expensive. The qualitative study concluded that information alone is not enough to get people to change their behavior, but also that people didn't have enough money to put advice into practice, which is obviously more of an issue for low income households. And finally, serving low ARPU customers makes it more difficult to generate both direct and indirect revenues, which underpin B2C business models. So learning from these two case studies, what can we say about viable business models? Customer acquisition is key. Any business model needs enough users to make it work. 
But the whole process of getting people signed up and registered is expensive and tricky. So this is where having the on the ground presence can really help. But a field presence can also do much more to help achieve positive changes in behavior. The technology platforms in both cases evolved through partnerships and investments over many years with Wazazi Nipendeni, for example, tracing its roots back over 20 years. Partnering with government bodies is an important part of this. The EFC only needed to get ministry approval of the messages, whereas several government agencies are active partners in Wazazi Nipendeni. But whatever the partnerships are, it needs clear product development leadership to make sure the product works for customers. It's interesting that the commercial model has been paused while Vodafone revise and consolidate their strategy, yet the donor funded model behind Wazazi Nipendeni appears to contract, attract continuing support. At the end of the research, for example, the role of Wazazi Nipendeni was recognized in several health policy documents and the main donor was exploring mechanisms for continuing donor support for the program, which has also extended into other mobile services all of which suggests there is a place for donor funded models. Finally, a couple of concluding points. We should say that GSMA have already published a load of documents on all of the services supported by M Nutrition, and these include lots of learning points. But here we'd like to address a couple of threats, if you like. Firstly, mobile markets are shifting towards data and rich interactive services. This risks splitting any market between those who can access this kind of technology and those who can't. And secondly, as the money focuses on new database services, it's easy to forget about those areas that still struggle to get any signal at all. Wazazi Nipendeni represents one example of a free for use service, but other services in the M Nutrition portfolio provide further examples. We think this is a really interesting topic and the GSMA have already done some work in this area. And linked to this is a, another idea we'd like to throw in for discussion. Through the M Nutrition program, donor money has been used to develop a resource that we've shown generates money for mobile companies through increased ARPU. Can we find a mechanism for returning a share of that financial benefit to donors? Finally, when we started this work, a VAS provider explained they wanted to know if it was better for him to go with a mobile operator or to stay independent. Now we've shown there are pros and cons of both approaches, but when it comes to getting positive change amongst the poorest, evidence from these two case studies tends to, want to point towards third party B2B models, mainly because they provide a way of dealing with customers face to face. So on that note, we'd like to just finish and say thank you. Can I hand back to, uh, to you, Inka? Thanks very much, Nigel. Um, Jess here from IDS. So, um, Thanks very much to all the presenters for these really interesting um, presentations. What we're going to do now is um, open up the conversation more to first respond to some of the questions that have come up throughout the presentations um, via the, the chat and Q&A boxes. Um, and then, you know, we'd welcome any further comments from people's own experience and um, involvement in similar kinds of mobile both programs. So um, I'm going to highlight some of the questions that have been raised, um, taking maybe two or three questions at a time and then um, between the panelists you can decide how best to um, respond to those. So um, starting with the kind of first portion of the presentations from Inka and Melissa. There were a few questions around the uh, service design. So um, question from Oli Inka Oswalali, I hope I pronounced that right, um, around 
the question on the slide around what factors are affecting the reach and uptake of services on who is paying for the service um, and was this service designed and developed based on the farmer's own requests and needs um, so perhaps pause to see if um, probably Melissa you might be best to respond on that point given that I think you led on that part of the discussion sure um, on the first question of who's paying for the service um, there's the service was initially um, there's an initial cost to the service um, it was initially priced at two Ghana cities and then it was the service fee was suspended. So for a while, Vodafone Pharma Club was provided for free for the service. It was free to farmers. Um, and then when Vodafone reinstated the service fee, it was reinstated at 0.5 Ghana cities for the service. Um, however, that's that was sort of the market price. Um, in our study specifically, because we wanted to encourage households to sign up and use the service for those farmers in our study sample, um, the study um, provided the service for free. Um, so it was a study who was paying for the service over the 18 month period, just for those farmers who are in the randomized encouragement group in our study. Um, in terms of design of the service um, based on farmers requests and needs there was there was a lot of energy and effort to design the content via um, a lot of partners um, and so the content was based on the farmers needs um, and there's a very extended also profiling initially to onboard farmers so that farmers could sort of choose what language they were wanting the messages to be provided in what crop was the preferred crop to be um, for for receiving messages on agriculture and nutrition um, and so the service in general was um, designed based on the farmer's need, but I think there was also a few um, barriers with respect to the, with respect to sort of the infrastructure in this context, with respect to the user's ability, um, the SMSs, for example, the text-based SMSs were sent out in English and a lot of farmers were illiterate, a lot of farmers couldn't read English. Um, the voice messages were sent out um, in the local language, um, but farmers weren't very accustomed to voice messages, so they didn't understand initially how to, how to access it or how, how to understand how to use the voice messages. So there were still some barriers, even though in, in general, though the idea was to design the service based on the farmer's needs. Great, thank you, Melissa. And I think you've also answered um, Yoko Inagiki's question around um, what language the text messages were written in. So thank you for covering that as well. Um, Inka, did you want to add anything um, to Melissa's point around in terms of the content? Um, yeah, perhaps um, just briefly referring to kind of um, one of the slides I presented, so um, Vodafone Pharma Club was delivered, so the M nutrition part was delivered via an existing agriculture platform, um, agriculture platform that run already for some time that was uh, tried and tested and had already quite a lot of experience in how to deliver information, agricultural information to farmers. So in particular, the agriculture contact was, was really well um, kind of set within the context and um, also well received by the farmers. So very um, kind of targeted to far, towards farmers' needs. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and um, Jan LeBeau asked a question about the profiling process, which Melissa, I think you referred to briefly just now in your response. Um, so she asked, would you recommend to do the profiling entirely at the first usage or little by little over several days? So yeah, um, 
I would recommend the the first time the registration process um, because it is also important that farmers receive messages quite quickly but the messages have to be relevant for them right so it's important that farmers are receiving the messages as soon as possible but in their language um, in the in their uh, specific to their region specific to their crop um, however the the profiling process is cumbersome. It does take a while. And so that's why sort of the in-person interaction, um, especially if sort of there's local experts or some trusted source is key in that moment. Yeah, perhaps to also add um, to this from the qualitative component, I, I think it's very important to kind of frequently revisit the profiling if this is uh, possible because farmers needs are changing are uh, then dynamic and to kind of update the profiles um, kind of might help to 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 enable some sustained engagement with the platform okay great thank you Inka um, and we've just had a, a related question come up um, in the chat box from Saloni, Saloni Sinha, about also about the content and of the messages. Um, so the question is, the messages sent to farmers, was it general advice around better farming techniques or also advice about promoting more nutrition sensitive agriculture? Yeah, it, um, should I start with answering perhaps and, and Melissa? could add or uh, somebody else could add additional mm. information so um the the information the agricultural information the farmers received was based on the initial profiling so they would get um only crop relevant information um, related to the crops they kind of highlighted in the initial registration process um, but then additionally to this, there were more nutrition sensitive kind of tips around the consumption of this particular crops, but also um, other nutrition sensitive information around um, food hygiene, around um, hand washing, around environmental hygiene, and a little bit on diet diversity. And here in particular, um, the consumption of animal sourced food. There were a few messages, um, particularly on, I think, egg and dairy consumption and meat consumptions. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Inka. Um, and earlier in the session, um, Arun Jadav asked a question, um, which may be something more for the, the Gamos team to answer, but um, I'll let you judge that, um, on whether there's any input um, from tele communication services um, on cross-selling of content to increase engagement and penetration. So that might also be something which, depending who we have on the call, if, if we have any um, representatives from companies who wanted to, to comment on that particular point, you could raise your hand. Uh, can I just say something on that, Jess, in the meantime? Go for it. Um, yeah, cross-selling. I mean, Vodafone were acutely aware uh, that they actually had a number of different uh, services reaching out to very similar customer segments in the agricultural sector. So I think one of the reasons they wanted to rethink uh, their, their strategy was to try and capture the potential to sell different products to the same customer segment. So for example, they got um, some services targeting specifically fishery community, fisher, fishermen and fishing communities, and they'd got uh, financial products and so on. And they were aware that once you've got the customer, there's enormous value then in being able to upsell more products. So I think that's what they were trying to do in their, uh, in their strategy revision. And um, I think that's one of the potential benefits of working in partnership with field agencies, because once you've got hold of a customer, you can then do a lot more for them 
in addition to giving the information through an SMS information dissemination service, if you've got an agency on the ground, you can then work with them to to provide additional services, be those uh, credit services or additional agricultural inputs, something on the ground. You've got an opportunity then to capitalize on the, the investment you've made in actually getting a hold of that client. And so it's a good question because it's, it's very, um, it's a key factor to trying to make the whole thing work in the whole. Thanks. Great, thank you, Nigel. Um, I just wondered if if Aaron wanted to to respond to that. Um, we are, I mean, we are offering people the option of of asking questions or following up to questions with the microphone if that's easier to sort of have more of a to and fro um, conversation about some of these issues. Um, you just need to unmute yourself um, to follow up, but. Aaron, would the event, would you like to respond to that or should we move on? Okay, he's saying thanks in the in the chat box. So I think we'll continue. Okay, great, thanks, Aaron. Um, so um, moving on now to some of the questions around the 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 business model just checking i haven't missed any other ones um actually before we do that there is a question a, a, around the design which i think maybe we should cover first um an anonymous question about whether did you do a factorial design so comparing the impact of text messaging versus phone call versus voice messages um and sorry, or were all of these delivered at once? So looking back, would you recommend that? So I suppose yeah. that's, yeah, quant design question really. Yeah, I can answer that. Um, that's a very good question. Uh, what we were looking at was the bundled service. So we were looking at the impact of the bundled service, which included everything within the bundle. Um, we are not able to disentangle um, the impacts of SMS versus voice. It, it is an interesting question, but the, the concept of Vodafone Pharma Club service was, was a bundled service, and that's what we evaluated. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else from the evaluation team wanna respond to that in terms of the other evaluation components. I think it's it's mainly related to the quantitative part. So we will move on now to um, some questions around the business model. So um, Alfred Yuboa asks a question about how do we transition from push to demand driven message services? So to, trying to meet to meet the customized needs of beneficiaries and increase adoption. Are there any business models around such a service? So I think that is a question for Simon and Nigel, Amos team. Yeah, Nigel here. Uh, hi, Alfred. Uh, yeah, very good question. Um, yeah, there are a number of different uh, products available in the market which are much more on the push side. I think you'll be familiar with the uh, 321 service and that's uh, quite an interesting approach it's it's using the um, availability so people can then phone in people are given a short number to 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 dial in and then they can go through a menu and you can listen to a voice message um, there's a business model around that. Uh, the business model that 321 uses a freemium model so that customers are allowed, I think it's up to 10 free uh, goes in a month. And if they then start to use the system more than that, um, you, they have to start paying for it. So it's kind of, it's a freemium model. But um, the beauty of the, pool 
demand based system is that users can then access the information at their convenience when they want. The downsides are um, well, with the 321 service, it's expensive because it's voice based. And once you've listened to the message, it's gone. One of the things people like about the SMS is that they can store it on their device. So the push service that we're looking at with Vodafone Farmers Club is an SMS based. So people receive the SMS and it stays on their phone so they can discuss it with their family. They can discuss it with friends and so on. So um, pros and cons of both models. Um, and I think in our reports, we, we kind of concluded that the ideal would be some sort of a hybrid model. So, and I think there's, there's more work going on that. Can I add something, um, Jess, to this? It's not um, around the business model, but more um, around who uses call centers. Um, from the evaluation, we found that people who are farmers who had used the call center um, usually had really good experience with it. But the challenge was a little bit who had the, the courage or to, to use the call center especially female farmers and less educated farmers often told us that they were reluctant to use a call center because they felt um, too uneducated to speak to the expert in the capital about their agriculture or nutrition problems. So there might be kind of a challenge with regards to inclusiveness and, and kind of who, who will use this um, kind of call-based services. Thank you. Yeah, the, that, that's uh, a, a good example of a kind of a hybrid service, if you like, that Vodafone set up because whereas the SMS messages were pushed out, uh, if farmers received the messages and they weren't quite sure what, the, uh, they weren't quite clear, they had the ability to call the, the call center for free and speak to an agricultural expert. So that was the, that was the demand, the pool side of it. It was just uh, a shame, as Zinka was saying, that not all the users were confident uh, and aware of that service. So it wasn't quite so well used, even though it's highly valued by those who did actually use it. Thanks. Thanks, Inka and Nigel. Um, we actually have two other questions which relate to this question about the sort of payment model. So. Um, perhaps good to bring these in here. So the first from Oli Inka about if donors are to get paid, then the poor farmers must be ready to pay. Um, and will their governments be ready to pay? And then there's a, a question more around this, the payment model as it relates to the evaluation design from Philip um, Abrahams. So if the study paid for the service, so farmers got it for free, wouldn't this skew farmers feedback compared to those who were paying for it. So that's more a question about the design of, of the evaluation. So yeah. I don't know, yes. yeah, Nigel, you want to cover the first question about? Yeah, okay. Um, who's paying, the who's the question pay? was about if donors are to get paid. Um, sorry, I might have gone over that a little bit too rapidly. Let me sort of take a step back. What we were, we're, we're aware, we try and explain a little bit more detail the, the, the kind of idea that we had. We're, we're aware that the donors were putting money into the, this is particularly the Wazazi Nipendeni program in Tanzania. And remember that that service was made available for free so the, the, it wasn't farmers, in, was as in, it was mothers and pregnant women. They were not paying. Service completely free to the user. But what we managed to show was that because women became more comfortable in using their phones, they became more confident, they understood how it worked, they, made, uh, they, they became more comfortable with using the phone, used it more often, spent more money so that was an indirect benefit but who gets you know who benefits from that indirect benefit it wasn't the organization that was running the service it was the mobile phone companies 
private commercial film companies. So it, the, uh, the question, if you like, is donors are putting money in on one hand, but the mobile phone companies are making a profit from that input. So the, the suggestion, if you like, was that it'd be uh, interesting to try and think if there, if there might be a mechanism for enabling the additional profits that the mobile phone companies are, are enjoying to share a little bit of that back with the donors that put the money into developing the, the product in the first place. So there was no suggestion that farmers or mothers should be ready to pay or indeed that uh, governments might need need to uh to to make some payment so sorry if that wasn't clear i hope that is a little bit clearer now let us know uh if um if if you've got some further questions on that one olienka does that answer your question okay you could just comment in the chat box if Great, thanks. Thanks, Nigel, for responding. Um, so, on the the second question ar around payment, which was more related to the the study design, um, and the fact that the farmers included in the study weren't paying and got it for free, and whether that would skew the feedback we got compared to those paying for it who were outside of the scope of the evaluation, um, is that something which either Inka or Melissa or Dan want to comment on? Yeah, I can start and then um, Dan or Inka can feel free to step in. Um, so it's true that in our study, um, the farmers were getting the service for free. Um, this actually occurred also outside of our study when Vodafone um, stopped um, having the price for the service. So they did offer the service for free even outside of our study, at the same time of our study, in fact, it happened. Um, but it, it is true that perhaps the way a farmer reacts or his feedback or how he, he, he interacts with the service might be different if they're paying or not paying for the service. Um, we did do a, a sub-study on farmers' willingness to pay for the service. Um, we were trying to see, um, and one of the questions we asked was, does farmers' willingness to pay for the service sort of affect how they interact with the service? So are farmers who are more willing to pay for the service, are they the ones who are going to be sort of more actively using the service? Um, and we did find that um, there was a, a small increase in how actively they use the service. Farmers who were more willing to pay did see a little more active usage of the service, but it was only, it was very short term. And then after a while, because we could see sort of their usage over time, after a while, it didn't really matter. Um, farmers willingness to pay wasn't really predicting um, their, 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 their usage of the service. So initially maybe, but then the, any effect dissipates over time. Okay, thank you, Melissa. Did anyone else in the evaluation team want to follow up on that? Or? Hi, Jess, this is Dan. Yeah. I might just um, sure. follow up. And Melissa, I'm glad that you mentioned the willingness to pay study. I, I think, you know, what we saw from in that study and the sort of the broader effort here, so there was a willingness to pay um, uh, at both the kind of initial two CD price, it was a, a relatively smaller group that was willing to pay that much, but even at the kind of half CD price, um, it was a much larger uh, share of respondents who had said that they, you know, they'd be willing to pay that price for such a service. Um, but the challenge for the MNOs and for Vodafone is whether uh, the revenue from that is really uh, worthwhile, at least initially, or, or whether it's worth sort of charging anything to start, or, or whether instead going for these free models um, to try to bring in a larger pool of participants is the better approach because there's not a substantial amount of revenue coming through that um, and and the bigger hurdle by far I think initially is just to get 
a large group of, of interested subscribers who get some experience with the service and start to engage with it. Um, and then the idea of maybe adding a, so, so I think our evidence is showing that it would be better to get the largest group in early and then potentially start to charge um, for the service once people have a positive experience with it and seem very engaged. Thanks. Great, any thanks, Dan? So um, another question which has come in around the quantitative design, which I think it'd be good to cover um, now is, do you think the personal attributes of the farmers and their willingness for behavioral change made a difference in the uptake of the service? And was that accounted for in the sampling framework in the control villages for the study? So again, I think that's one for the IFPRI team. Sorry, can you can you repeat the the question, Jess? Yeah, sure. So it's um, whether you think the, the personal attributes of the farmers and their willingness to change behavior made a difference in, in how we saw they up, took up the service. Okay. Um, so, in terms of, I, I think there, it, ra it raises sort of two different points um, in terms of internal validity of the study and external validity of the study. In terms of internal validity, when we were sort of comparing our encouraged group to our comparison group, the personal attributes of the farmers, um, because it was randomized, should be similar on average. Um, so the internal validity, it, the randomization helps with the internal validity in terms of sort of any subsequent impacts. Um, we don't think sort of the personal attributes of one type of farmer in the comparison group versus the, we, we think the, the type of personal attributes in both of our sort of comparison and encouragement arms should be the same on average. So that won't be influencing any sort of of the impacts we see when we compare those two groups. Um, it does come into question though a little more in terms of the external validity of the study um, because we did not sample our farmers, um, they're not sort of representative, representative of the overall um, Ghanaian population. Um, we sampled very specifically our farmers to be farmers and they had to also own a mobile phone um, because the intervention was through a mobile phone and they also had to have a female um, within I think the age range of 15 to 65 or 49 if I recall. Um, I forget exactly what the age range of the of our target woman was supposed to be. Um, and there's two reasons why we also did that. We did that because a lot of our indicators um, were on women. So we were looking at one of our main outcomes of interest was women's dietary diversity. And so we wanted to make sure that the households that we sampled had a, a woman in it. So there, it's not representative of the sample um, of Ghana. Um, but even so, I think within this sample, which um, there, there's still a lot of lessons to be learned within this sample. Um, and in fact, I mean, one, one I guess, um, weakness is, is that because farmers actually had to have phones to be included in our sample, we are excluding the poorest of the poor farmers from the study. And so it's true that that could sort of, um, Ha, had we not excluded them, then some of the, our conclusions might have been different for the poorest of the poorest farmers who don't even have phones. But I think there's still a lot of learning that we could do within the sample that we that we analyzed. I don't know if Dan or Inka want to add anything to that. Perhaps um, not with regards to how the counterfactual was um, kind of selected, but more with regards to characteristics of the farmers who 
um, well successfully engaged and and um, in a sustained manner engaged with the mobile phone and then reported some individual level behavior change um, in the final qualitative round we in particular um, zoomed into the subgroup of farmers who were still after um, one and a half years almost two years engaged with the service and we kind of found that um, we had expected that for example younger farmers would still be engaging with the with the intervention and that perhaps um, male farmers or socioeconomic status would kind of be a pattern that would emerge with regards to long-term or sustained engagement. But we didn't really found this based on the qualitative data, so not rep a representative quantitative sample, but based on the qualitative data, we didn't really found any of the expected patterns, but more um, we found that all the farmers um, independent of age or whether they were male or female or rich or poor, um, kind of internal locus of control or perceived agency emerged really as a kind of determinant factor in a way of whether or not they engaged with the, with the intervention in the longer term and whether they believed they could actually change something in, in their life because of the, the messages. So this was kind of an interesting finding with regards to kind of what characteristics might influence um, long-term engagement with, uh, with the intervention. And there were um, kind of some other factors that were relevant for sustained engagement that we drew out um, from the kind of last qualitative data collection round. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, Nigel is... here. Can I... Sorry, Nigel, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Dan. I, I was just gonna very quickly mention the, um... Uh, one of the bits of work that GSMA did um, earlier on in the program was some user experience research. And they did some fascinating work identifying different, you know, segmenting farmers. They're not a homogenous group. There's lots of different types of farmers. So they identified different types of farmers who are more likely to take up this kind of a service uh, at the beginning and who are likely to change their behavior. So, uh, yeah, sorry, Dan, over to you. No, that's helpful, Nigel. And I, I just wanted to point out, um, picking up on this question, the um, when we looked at the quantitative data, the results were similar with the, to what um, Inca was just reporting from the qual data, and that um, some of the characteristics that we might think would be associated with kind of extended use and, and participation in the platform um, didn't show up as being very important. So gender, for example, was not a major determinant of how long people engaged with the program. But two things that stood out in the quant analysis, um, one was education, so better educated users were more likely to stay with it longer. And then also uh, loyalty to the network, essentially, if, if your main network was Vodafone, and it may just be that then that you're, you spend more time there, and so that meant that you're more likely to um, engage with the service. But um, some of the other uh, some of the other characteristics that you, you might expect we didn't see a lot of other things kind of popping through as being very important. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Um, I think those responses have also covered the question um, which Matt Strickland put in the chat box. Um, Matt, let us know if if you feel that this has already been covered. I'll just I'll just repeat the question in case there's anything else anyone wants to add on this point. So am I correct in understanding that those who were active generally liked the content and bundle and in general the issue was keeping on activating, sorry, keeping or activating or users in the first place. So I think I think Dan um, and Inca have already sort of covered some of that question already but um, Matt, if there's any kind of follow up on that or sort of additional details, you can either put that in the chat box or grab the mic if you'd like to to respond. I can just sort of quickly follow up on that too um, to, to say that that is correct um, that for the for the small group of active farmers who are actively using, listening to the voice messages, um, they were happy with the content. It was just a matter of the barriers to become sort of an active user.
Okay, thanks, Melissa. I'm just checking um, if Matt has responded on that because there's a couple of different chat boxes. Okay, um, great, thank you. I think we've covered that well. Um, so we've only got a couple of minutes left of this Q and A session. So just encourage anyone else who's got any burning questions to quickly note those down um, in the chat box or raise their hand. And there's a couple we still need to to get through, um, which is a more of a question I think for um, Vodafone themselves. If I if anyone is on the call, they might want to respond directly to this, or else um, perhaps the evaluation team from what we know. So a question from Ulai Gludi Armel, which is what is the plan to integrate these interesting lessons learned into the revamped products by the Vodafone Pharma Club providers? So if there is anyone from the Vodafone team who wants to pick up directly on that question, feel free. Otherwise, perhaps um, Nigel or Simon, that might be a, something you could share some thoughts on based on what, at least what we know from our side. Can I just make a couple of points while anyone from Vodafone is trying to find the unmute button? Um, yeah, I think I mentioned earlier that Vodafone explained to us that the reason they paused the service uh, earlier was in order to try and consolidate what they've got. So we know they're they're trying to reposition themselves with respect to this um, low income farmers market. Uh, the other group that we sh we must um, credit is uh, Isoko. Uh, who are the content provider who've been in this game for many years, have a lot of experience and um, uh, we know that, th I mean, they are also continuing to upgrade their service in the light of their experience. So, so they may also be um, looking to integrate some of this stuff. It'd be interesting to hear from them as well. Thanks. Thanks, Nigel. Um, it doesn't look like anyone's stepping forward at this point. Um, so perhaps we'll, I know we've got a couple of minutes left. So I just wanted to pick up on another question which um, was asked early on. And sorry, I've just <laughs> discovered it from Dominic Glover from IDS. Sorry, I missed you earlier, Dominic. Um, which is uh, a comment about in the spirit of constructive discussion, I'm struck that most of the insights have rather little to do with the M in M nutrition or M agri. So that's the mobile part. Um, in terms of providing information and encouraging active participation and engagement, most of the insights are already familiar from the fields of strategic communication, agriculture extension and clinical care, from social media and distance learning. Um, so he says, you haven't shared any information about the ultimate impacts of the information provided, i.e. did farmers and consumers outcomes actually improve? So does this preoccupation tell us something about the dangers for development of getting dazzled by the digital interface platform? So I know that's quite a, a long sort of commentary question there. Um, Dominic, if you did want to jump on and kind of elaborate a bit on the chat, I mean, sorry, through the mic, please feel free. Well, perhaps I can start with answering, Jess. Um, sure. So kind of in, well, in the evaluation, we looked at um, how the mobile phone um, was kind of a, um, a specific delivery mechanism for um, information and what in particular um, about the mobile phone kind of as a delivery channel might kind of trigger behavior change or might lead to engaged um, interaction with, uh, with the intervention and what kind of mobile phone technology might add on um, in comparison to other more traditional behavior change approaches. And we found, um, for example, that the mobile phone um, kind of 
facilitated inter-household interaction um, because in particular female farmers or also this comes also from Tanzania in particular mothers they kind of used the, the mobile phone as a tool in inter-household negotiation and kind of said um, they got the information from a kind of neutral source and then in their inter-household discussion showed the mobile phone with uh, kind of messages to convince the husbands to, for example, provide more money to buy nutritious food for children. So the mobile phone was kind of an additional mechanism that helped um, to trigger behavior change. And we draw out, we are currently doing some additional analysis to in particular draw out the kind of additional or added on benefit of adding mobile phones to behavior change intervention. And of course, there were also other aspects um, like convenience um, was highlighted by um, farmers, convenience of when to access the information was higher than with traditional agricultural extension um, services that visited the village at a given time and it was um, kind of often not possible to, ad uh, to attend the meetings or it wasn't possible for female farmers to attend meetings and with a mobile phone kind of this access barriers were removed. Um, so different aspects um, of how the mobile phone kind of changed uh, behavior, changed communication to the better emerged um, from, from the evaluation. Yep. Okay, thank you, Inka. I think um, we've reached 3.30 UK time, so um, I think we need to move on to the to sort of final five minutes of wrapping up. And I believe you have one slide to share on that, if you want to. Um, yeah, we, yeah, thanks, thanks, Melissa. Um, thanks, Jess. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we have kind of some final remarks um, as an evaluation team that we kind of wanted to make. So we, we, we feel or we concluded based on the evaluation that mobile phone based services are not a magic bullet for behavior change, but they were highly valued by the users who actively engaged with the service. And they also are likely or might be a valuable addition to programs um, aiming to change behaviors and improving knowledge. Knowledge, especially if combined with some kind of interactive component and interpersonal support. There, are, as we highlighted throughout the presentation and the discussion, there are still some outstanding implementation and programmatic issues that need to be addressed to, to really fully leverage the power of mobile phones for behavior change. And we know from our discussion throughout the evaluation that GSMA is already working on um, many of these issues and they will kind of be realized in the next version of M Nutrition and so are local um, providers and MNOs. And um, also mobile phone based services are more likely to or more effective to change behaviors if they are embedded in existing trusted structures such as agricultural extension services and are linked up with um, other programs in particular programs that help to address some of the underlying barriers to behavior change and here social protection programs to address um, kind of poverty um, might be an uh, effective strategy. Also, um, one should consider to combine mobile phone-based intervention with other low-tech approaches such as radios to increase inclusiveness and also reach um, households that don't have access to a mobile phone or females, female farmers who might not have access to a mobile phone and uh, provide interpersonal support throughout the mobile phone based intervention to, to encourage um, sustained engagement, but also behavior change. You can find um, our reports, our detailed reports from each of the component, as well as the uh, mixed method reports and uh, lessons learned briefs um, on our website. And you can also find their blogs and um, some other pieces um, reflecting on the evaluation. They are all um, available to download free of charge. And please don't hesitate to contact us if you have further questions.